and a half. Thank you everyone for coming. We're going to get started straight away just to make sure that we can keep on schedule. Um, of course, today we have the Q&A panel with the Drupal Association Founding Director, Chair and CEO. We are very, very lucky to have them at Drupal South Sydney. Um, join me very quickly in just a round of applause to say thanks for coming along. So joining us today, first of all, as a man who should need no introduction, but just in case, our first panelist is Dries Bertert. Um, he is, of course, the creator of the Drupal project, um, first released all the way back in 2001. And in addition to serving as the founding director of the Drupal Association, uh, Dries also serves as the chief technology and strategy officer and co-founder of Acquia. He has been a member of Drupal.org for 22 years and 11 months. Um, and he initially, I found this out in my research, and please fact check me as I go, initially the plan was to call the project DORP, which is Dutch for village. Yeah, sort of, yeah. yeah. So like, do you want me to talk about yeah. it? Yeah. All right, so my, web, my original website was an intranet, and when I finished college, I moved out of my dorm, and I wanted to move our intranet to the public domain, or to the public internet, I should say. And so I needed a, a domain name, because as an intranet, you didn't need a domain name. And so I wanted to register uh, dorp, D-O-R-P, dot org, which is Dutch for small village or community. But I made a typo. I switched the O and the R, and ended up registering drop.org. And I'm like, wow. I'm rich because <laughs> it's like a four-letter domain name in English words, and it was still available. So I ended up with drop.org instead of dorp.org, and that led to Drupal and so on and on and on. So, so you can use that if things don't work out with this Drupal thing. You've <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> got a room full of people here who are ready to I be... still have the domain name, yeah. They can, they can, we can all be dorp users and developers, <laughs> and, and this can easily become dorp south. I better go and register that. Um, so a, a quick opening question for Dries. Um, when Drupal sends a web page, if, if, for those of you who don't know, it includes a bit of metadata which sets the expiry date for the content to Dries's birthday, November 19, 1978. Now we heard a bit this morning about the reasons why Drupal was created and how you got started. But I'd just like to challenge you quickly. Did you secretly create the Drupal project push it to global popularity, powering 14% of the top 10,000 websites worldwide, and then went on to create the Drupal Association with 1.4 million members, simply so no one would forget your birthday. Uh, almost. It was actually an experiment in subliminal messaging to see if I would get any birthday cards. And yep. hasn't worked. <laughs> but it's kind of a crazy idea, because if you think about all the Drupal sites in the world, and then you know, basically every second, Drupal's around the world must be serving, I don't even know, thousands and thousands of pages every second. And so my birthday is sent <laughs> around the world all the time, you know? Yeah. And yeah, no birthday cards. Sorry. Okay. And by the way, I didn't put my own birthday in. Oh, it isn't? Yeah, no, I didn't. Like, so another contributor actually added my birthday. Uh, just so, you know, just convenient. wanted to... Make that clear on the record. OK. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of on the record, we're going to go to our next panelist now, which is, of course, none other than, the, than Tim Doyle, the Drupal Association CEO. Uh, Tim has an extensive career in nonprofit and government, having previously shepherded a public sector technology startup in the US into an impactful nonprofit with over $85 million in annual revenues. Uh, Tim is now working on executing the association's strategic three-year plan, and we'll certainly hear more about that on this panel. Uh, my opening question for Tim, and just a reminder that this is on the record and being recorded, you've now, you've been, you've been doing a little bit of travel that's brought you to Australia finally, but you've been in Singapore, you've been in India, you've come all the way from the US. Why is the Australian and New Zealand Drupal community your favourite? <laughs> so this is on the record and, be, and being recorded? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, it is, uh, the Australian New Zealand community is definitely one of uh, my most favorite communities among many. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think in brief, I'll say uh, um, I when I first heard about when I first came to Drupal and heard about Drupal South, and it's I think it's the longest running uh, Drupal event uh, in this area. Um, consistently, people talk about Drupal South uh, being a great event. Uh, and then when my new chair 
of the Drupal Association was from Australia. I thought it would be very advantageous for me to be here mm. and, uh, and to kiss up to, I mean, to uh, explain <laughs> what we're doing. Well, thank you very much for coming. We're very happy to have you here. Um, and of course, the final panelist is none other than our own Owen Lansbury. Owen is the current chair of the Drupal Association and chair at Previous Next. Thank you for sponsoring Drupal South. Um, Owen is part of the team that helped found Drupal South as an organization, or Dorp South as we should be referring to it. Um, and uh, we're immensely grateful for the work that, that Owen and others put into making this, um, this possible. Uh, Owen is also the Vice President of Communications at the Mountain Safety Collective, a nonprofit that produces backcountry condition reports and avalanche forecasting a role he credits as helping him prepare for the life and death decisions that he makes as chair of, Dru of the Drupal Association <laughs> every day. Um, Owen achieved notoriety internationally when he and his tour guide were very nearly eaten alive by a snow leopard while skiing in India. On the way to DrupalCon Mumbai. Okay, on the way to DrupalCon Mumbai. Um, Thankfully, when the snow leopard saw Owen, it ran off into the woods. <laughs> so opening question for Owen. Um, how has your proven dominance over wildcats helped you to become a better leader in the Drupal Association? Meow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, that we'll, take that, we'll take that as the whole answer. All right, so quickly, very, very quickly, I'll introduce myself. For those of you I don't know, I'm the managing director and co-founder of an enterprise Drupal host called Einstar. I am the treasurer at Drupal South and chair of the newly formed Drupal Asia Steering Committee. Um, I don't have to answer any of these silly profile questions, so we will move right along. Um, really quickly, what is the Drupal Association? I'll, I'll put this in my own words really quickly, but guys, please jump in if I get anything wrong. It is the nonprofit working to advance Drupal. Dries spoke a lot about this in his keynote this morning. It oversees DrupalCon, the certified partner program, a lot of the technical infrastructure that powers Drupal, Drupal.org, GitLab, and so on. Um, there are 15 permanent association staff, and is it 13 board members? Uh, yep. Yep. Um, and if you want to know more about the association, go to Drupal.org slash association. Um, there is a bit of a format for this. Uh, in advance of the session, I reached out to parts of the community in the Australia NZ channel on Drupal Slack. If you are not in the Drupal Slack and you're not in that channel, um, please join the 663 members, making it the 42nd most populist uh, channel um, in Drupal Slack, and I believe the most populous region-focused channel. Um, so get on board, help us get to 700, and we can show those people over in hashtag testing who's boss. Um, uh, if you have any question you'd like the panel to answer, you can scan that QR code, there's a Slido link, or you can drop into the Slack and post it in there. We're not going to be able to get to every question, but we will do our very best to try. Um, so, let's jump straight into the first question. And, and please feel free to, whoever wants to answer, just jump in and answer. Is there any update on the association's plans to provide dedicated funding to Drupal core development that was presented by Owen in his session in Brisbane in 2022. To be clear, it was not a plan, it was a concept okay. <clears throat> that's now been socialized. And Tim, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we're, um, a couple of things we're doing to, uh, and, and I take a little bit bigger view on this, pick, on this question, uh, which is not just direct funding, but how do we prompt innovation? So we're making changes uh, to our Drupal Certified Partner Program to make that about contributions uh, to focus on companies that are contributing. Uh, and then at the same time, to raise revenue to stabilize the association's revenue and allow us to invest monies in innovation. Uh, exactly where, uh, we've been doing some, some tests of where investments in innovation would work well and, and, and ideas like Pittsburgh was one of those. Um, the health dashboard that uh, Therese mentioned earlier is one of those. Um, where we make those strategic investments uh, will be determined by the board uh, going forward based on where we think we can have the biggest impact. Um, so that's about as far as we've gone in our thinking in terms of um, the association's plans uh, for, for funding uh, contribution. Yeah, I would just add that um, historically there's been nervousness or we've been skittish <laughs> for the Drupal Association to get involved with these things. Um, but I really do believe that we need to give the Drupal Association a license to help innovate. 
You know, it doesn't mean all the innovation is going to come from the Drupal Association, but they can certainly help fund more contributors and maybe even core committers. And I think that would be a very healthy thing to do. Um, so. And I'll just add one final thing. So I did do a talk at FOSTEM in February that goes into a lot of detail about these types of things. And a point that I made is that contribution has never been free. Uh, and it has been funded by organisations, whether it's Arquia or Previous Next or Salsa, who've really done a great job in the, the past couple of years to kind of embed that into their own culture. But that's been funded by those companies and everyone else is benefiting from, from that internal funding. What we're trying to do with the DCP in particular is to raise the awareness of how you can create that model within your organisation if open source is at the core of your business. And the simplest way to think about it is that if you rely on open source, then by contributing into those projects, you are going to elevate the actual business side of what you're doing. It's not a cost. <laughs> so that's just something I wanted to hammer home. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, all right, the next question. It's been three years since Slack gave the Drupal community three months of enterprise subscription for free. Uh, we have a trove of information and discussions accessible in our search history. Does the DA have a contingency plan if Slack withdrew this offer and we were suddenly locked out of our search history? Right, so, and uh, I used Slack for the first time when I came to the Drupal Association a year and a half ago, so I'm still learning about Slack. And my understanding, looking at uh, why we use Slack, uh, I think community members set up the initial Slack channels initially. Uh, and the sense I got is two things. One is um, that, and I think a posture of the, of the Drupal Association is to let people vote with their feet and then support where they go with that, right? So we don't have, and there's, my sense of the community is that the community in general has a very pragmatic view about what's the best way to advance Drupal um, and what tools do we need to kind of help facilitate the community's interactions. Uh, Slack seems to be working right now. I know there are other alternatives out there. Uh, we're, um, we've had no plans yet to have kind of um, uh, like dogmatically pursue open, everything open source no matter what. Um, and I think we kind of want to get a sense of where the, if the community is going somewhere. If, if they were to pull back a, the free offering, that would be very expensive and we would have to look for alternatives. And the eight, I guess it's $8 a, a user, you know, if they charge us. There's no way a month, there's no way obviously the Drupal Association could fund that for the, for the height of our community. So we would then have to make plans uh, for what to do. Uh, but we don't currently have any plans to, to move off Slack or, or uh, look for alternatives. OK, thank you. Um, what is the plan, sorry, <clears throat> sorry, what is the plan for the Drupal project to remain competitive? <laughs> well, I kind of touched upon that a little bit in my presentation, but it's like basically at the highest level, it's accelerating innovation. As I mentioned, like I think everything starts with Drupal being a great product that people actually want to use because people don't really join because of the community. I mean, some people do, but most people join because they have a problem to solve and Drupal is the best tool to solve it. And so that's why we need to drive innovation. Uh, and secondly, it's driving marketing. You know, as I talked about, like we need to tell the world about all the great things that Drupal does. And so at a high level, that is the plan, <laughs> um, as I mentioned. now. In the day-to-day -day tactics, there is you know, 100 different things that we need to do uh, to actually live up to that plan from improving our fundraising capabilities so we can spend more money on marketing and spend money on innovation to improving our tools to, like there's so many things that are now part of the plan. Um, I think for me, what's exciting is that we've spent a lot of time working on a plan with the Drupal Association. We, we set goals and metrics. You can go look at the metrics, and we're tracking the metrics, and we're driving various actions for each of the strategic goals. And anyway, Tim has done a great job putting it all together, um, and you know, driving the team to focus on that. Thank you. And when I saw this question, what what's front of mind to me is the marketing, the product marketing strategy, uh, and work that the Drupal Association will be doing. So we hired a firm developed a product marketing strategy for Drupal as if we were marketing the, the product. 
um, and that will guide our tactical decision. So we're bringing on a marketing person. I personally, where I sit right now, I see this marketing as the as uh, uh, a top issue for Drupal's competitiveness in the world. Um, we have a lot of strengths. The, the community is strong. We saw, we saw the numbers, innovation, first to AI, all that. So. Just where I sit, I'm less worried about Drupal's competitiveness from the product feature side, if you will, and it's more the marketing side. And you'll see out of this strategy, the Drupal Association, we don't sell services, but we'll be marketing the product um, uh, in conjunction with our partners. Well, just going to add one quick thing. And like sometimes these questions, there is sort of a tone, I guess, in them that suggests that maybe Drupal isn't competitive. And there's definitely some data points where, you know, like maybe Stack Overflow surveys where the sentiment is a little bit lower. But I will say, like, Drupal is very, very competitive today, you know? So it's like, I don't want it to be implied that we're no longer competitive. I don't know if it was, but like Drupal is winning um, in a lot of different markets for a lot of different reasons, mm -hmm. you know? So just wanted to. To bring that up. That, that was similar to what I was going to talk about. So for anyone that went through the Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 uh, migration period, that was a really hard choice that Dries made at that time to secure the future of Drupal as a relevant, stable product. And a couple of years ago, there was this talk of, oh, Drupal's market shares slipping. I reached out to Kim Pepper, whose opinion I sometimes <laughs> pay attention <Okay>. to. <laughs> and said, go and look at the alternatives. If we needed to pivot away from Drupal, what are the alternatives? And he came back, and I definitely respect this opinion, that bar none, Drupal is by far the best product that we can sustain our business with if there's still a market for it. And so what Dries talked about in his keynote today is that that rock solid foundation is there, mm. and now we have the ability to then innovate rapidly on top of it. And the talk that Morgan gave just before this one, he's got the most cutting edge AI um, image recognition platform running on top of Drupal 10. And that's exactly what we're talking about here is we've got the foundation there with a bit of a nudge in terms of marketing to compete with the likes of Adobe who have their own kill Drupal team <coughs> that we need to compete against. Then we've got another decade or two ahead of yeah. us. It's, it's really exciting. I think it's, it's, it's probably fair to point out the, the question is remain competitive. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's definitely, it, it's, it's asked with positivity in mind, I think. So, all right, we've only got 10 minutes left. Um, if, oh, we can, we've, we've got more than 10 minutes. An hour and a half, we did it, all right. Um, <laughs> well, we've got lunch next, don't we? No one's having lunch. We're bringing in lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you could change one thing about the Drupal Association, what would it be? Assume, assume that you can snap your fingers and it's done and there's no Definitely no a question for two. <laughs> a double microphone one. OK. So <laughs> uh, if I could change two things about the uh, Drupal Association. Uh, I'm gonna, this is a negotiation tactic. You always go one up. Um, so first is, uh, you know, I came on board. Uh, my understanding of the association was coming out of COVID uh, with very stable um, uh, a financial position, which was good and positive. But the financial position of the association is not sufficient to fulfill the goals and ideas that the board has and, and, and what they want us to take on. So if I could snap my fingers and do one thing magically, it would be uh, to uh, improve the financial uh, strength of the organization in terms of, of uh, revenues coming in and our ability to spend money back on the community initiatives. So I want, that's not a snap of finger. That will happen, and we're on, we're on track for doing that, and that's, that's something I will do. If I, one magical thing if I could do is I would raise the profile of the Drupal Association outside of the community, that it begins to be seen as, a, as, as an association by outsiders representing Drupal, the product, and community, so people outside the community can see us as a source of uh, um, objective information and so forth. So that you know, is, is, would be beneficial, I think, to the community. If we could raise the profile of Drupal Association as an uh, arbiter of good information outside the community. Great. OK, thank you. Um, we'll do one more of the prepared questions, and then we'll go to the Slido questions. Um, so what is being done to increase Drupal's presence in markets outside of the US and Europe? Can we talk about the secret? That's up, that's up to you. 
I did not plant this question, by the way. <laughs> but you could talk about the secret if you want to. So I'll start and have uh, Owen and others weigh in, Therese weigh in. Um, so I'm here. Um, so when I first got on board, the first six months I spent talking to a lot of CEOs of our partners. And um, the one thing I heard consistently was that the Drupal Association is seen as too US centric. So it was very uh, uh, obvious to me that I needed to make sure that we were uh, truly being a global association representing a global technology. So there's a number of things we've done um, or, or are doing. Nothing's completed yet. Um, we hired, uh, I'm beginning to hire folks outside of the U.S. We're a fully distributed uh, workforce, uh, and I have three employees that are outside of the U.S. Um, I think that's helpful. Um, when we had the opportunity to do a major marketing um, uh, strategy, or I mean initiative, the Web Summit that Therese talked about, we went to uh, 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 the event in, in Europe uh, to, uh, to, uh, for our first marketing strategy. Um, and then lastly, I think part of my trip over here was through uh, India and Singapore to meet with those, um, with those communities in order to start to build the relationships. And that's really what we need to focus on. Is, and I have a staff dedicated to begin interacting with local associations to understand what they need and to begin to build the relationship between the DA and, and the folks uh, on the ground in Drupal communities uh, outside. So I do think we're doing a number of things. You'll, you'll start, hopefully start seeing that. Um, I'll add to that. I won't talk about the secret because okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep the suspense. Okay. Um, but it's the classic Monty Python thing. What did the Romans ever do for me? And I think my perspective of the DA early on as being a small agency in Australia was, well, what, what value do they bring to us in Australia? And I think we were able to early on recognise that without Drupal thriving as a project, we have no business so we've got an opportunity to play a role in ensuring that Drupal thrives and, and succeeds. And that is open to, to anyone. <clears throat> um, and you'll get the classic question, Tim probably gets it all the time, what are you doing about this? And my response to that is, well, what are you doing? Okay, we're a duocracy here. If you are concerned about something in terms of it being um, a really core issue for you, then put the time in to help address that issue. Uh, and there's many avenues use open for you to do that. So that, that's really important to just keep in mind is that while we're tucked away at the bottom of the world here, we can still play a very active role. And how these guys got some Aussie on <laughs> the Drupal Association board helping kind of realize what the future of Drupal is going to look like. That's open to everyone. Yeah. OK, great. Uh, there's a question from the room here. Uh, how might we raise awareness and motivation for new developers to contribute to Drupal? Sure, I mean, I think one, I mean, obviously collaborating with schools and universities would be one, er, one th big thing to do. And I've actually talked to quite a few of them and their big struggle is um, really, I would say, twofold. One is um, good documentation and like so they can actually use to create curriculum. And the second piece, uh, interestingly enough, um, is um, it's too difficult to get started with Drupal. And so um, one of the core committers actually is a part-time teacher. And he, believe it or not, teaches React um, at a university. And he would love to teach Drupal at the university, but uh, his name is Ben, uh, ben Mullins. Um, and he's like, it would take me too many classes just to get up and running with Drupal, you know? And so by the time the semester is over, we wouldn't have been able to cover enough material. And so a lot of the initiatives that we're working on, like Project Browser and simplifying the onboarding experience and recipes, they're all great things. Because uh, I think if you're a school, like you need to be able to get to teaching valuable things quickly, like within the first couple hours of class, you know, like versus, like, help, you know, not actually getting to that part. And so, so that's one thing that we're doing. Um, and then the second thing I would say is like, we have to go to where um, the up and coming developers, the young professionals are, you know, like they're not gonna come to us necessarily, but we have to go to where they are. 
And Web Summit is a great example of that. You know, they're all going to these conferences or they're all reading certain um, websites, like, I don't know, Smashing Magazine or whatever it is that they do. And we need to make sure that we have a presence where they are. So it's up to us, it's up to all of us, like in the spirit of what Owen just said, like how might we go to where they are? And I don't know where they are in Australia necessarily, but I bet you they're in certain communities, in certain places, you know, and um, yeah, we have to get out of our bubble, so to speak, and go meet them and talk about Drupal, because when we do, and we saw this at Web Summit, they're really intrigued and interested because Drupal can be an incredible career choice for them. They just don't know, you know, and they, we, we just need to tell that story. So there's a lot of other things we can do, but these are two things that come to mind. Yeah. So what, one thing that you'll see me post about in our local Slack channel occasionally is, hey, there's this great conference coming up that's not a Drupal conference. That's a great place to tell Drupal stories at um, and definitely take advantage of that. Um, if you're in a position to do so. Again, look for the opportunities where you can kind of step up and, and, and play a role. Um, I think the other thing that I've seen kind of traveling around the world is that there is new energy around Drupal, particularly in Europe. Uh, there's a lot of younger developers coming to, to Drupal uh, con in Europe in recent years, and that just brings its own energy. And it's the employers of those younger people who are bringing them to the conferences. So again, if you're an agency leader and you're looking at um, who's going to come to a conference, bring your younger people. Okay, It's not just about the, the leadership that should be at these conferences. It should be from the most junior developer up. So. I also think it's about like going back to our roots a little bit as well. Like I see a lot of young people maybe like getting started with like a contentful or something, you know? But like, then I have to remind them, like, you know what, that's like a proprietary SaaS vendor. And here's the five things <laughs> that are not great about proprietary SaaS software. You know, like as much as they fall in love with uh, maybe the ease of use of these tools, like I feel like we've forgotten some of these original open source values of why it's great to be in control of the software and to you know host it yourself so you can make changes to it and all of these things so a lot of it is like basic blocking and tackling to explain what we do um, and i will say like we have a great story like we have a story that can convince many young people like you know these people get recruited also by the adobes and the optimizers of the world and i can tell you like most of them would rather be part of drupal <laughs> Like, you know, it's to, to get sucked into like a commercial proprietary ecosystem. It's not appealing to everyone. So I think we have a chance to convince them to join um, the Drupal project. And I think telling the career stories, telling the opportunities, um, talking about the innovation and why it's a great bet to bet the next few years of your life on, uh, or the next 10 years of your life, I think uh, it's up to us to do. And it's probably something that, as we think about marketing, it's, it should be part of the marketing efforts that we have. Great. I was just going to add that one piece. That resonates with the younger generation, working on something that's larger than yourself. Like consistently the surveys are coming back saying they don't want to just graduate and get into be a cog in a machine. They want to work on something larger than themselves. Part of the reason why there's so much job hopping among Gen Z. Um, I think that's what Drupal offers. And so that message is really important when you talk to young people. OK, do we have time for one more? OK, we have time. Good. Um, I, Tim, this might be one for you. The certified Drupal program supports Drupal. What are the ways the DA is supporting certified partners to succeed? And I might add just really quickly to that, for those agencies and development houses that are in the room that aren't in the DCP, what are some of the benefits for them to join? Sure. Uh, thank you for that question. We're, um, so we have a Drupal certified partner program. It started a couple years ago before I got here. Uh, and we are making enhancements to it to make it focused on and supportive of companies that are contributing back code. So a couple things we're doing to change, probably the two biggest things, which will also be a benefit. First, uh, we are making the program um, about uh, contribution of code or, or contribution to the community, not about financial contribution. It's about contributing code. 
and creating in your company that culture of contribution, that culture of community involvement that, that Owen talked about that will build your brand not only within the community but potentially outside the community. Second thing we're doing on Dribble.org, and this is part of our marketing efforts, or we'll tie into it, we have a marketplace. And the idea in the marketplace is those companies that are contributors can get, if they're at certain levels, they get a badge. Uh, and then de dependent on their contributions, uh, they will be ranked. Uh, and that is a page that was designed to have folks who are uh, interested, maybe outside the community, looking to go to that page and see who are the agencies. Right now, uh, we have um, 2,200 companies on there. Of those, 591 have contributed any code in the last year or so. Uh, and of those, we only have 84 partners. So the goal of the enhanced DCP program is to get more, is to add to that 84 number. A lot of companies here are DCPs. Um, how do we get those companies that aren't uh, to, uh, to focus on uh, the contribution requirements to become a DCP? Um, the benefits will be, so we're going to make the marketplace, which we'll probably rename, uh, only open to Drupal certified partners after April 1st. And the idea is to really highlight so that those 84 companies aren't lost in the 2,200. Um, that's one. Uh, then most of our benefits that we uh, are being consolidated under this program. So um, we will do an RFP letter if you're applying for a government, you know, you're bidding Drupal. We'll say, yep, here's a certified partner program. This company's a certified partner. Uh, discounts on DrupalCons for your staff. Um, discounts on sponsorships of DrupalCon. Um, it currently, your rank, um, we just announced this in January, if you sponsor a local camp financially, that sponsorship can translate into credit on the marketplace. So you can move up the marketplace. Um, we have other, other initiatives like the um, Beyond the Build, which is uh, once a month we'll go to a certified partner and do a video case study of one of their projects that they like to highlight, and then we'll promote that. We'll also promote it on social media. So we're trying to co consolidate the benefits under the Drupal Certified Partner Program so it's has a meaningful impact in your company's uh, image within the community, but also outside the community. I'll add to that from a kind of agency owner perspective. Uh, and as a matter of looking at how you can turn your company into a better open source company and what the business ramifications that creates for you. So your staff become global experts <laughs> in the software, they're mentored by other global experts, they're working at the cutting edge of anything that's new that's happening in the, in the platform, and you're able to walk into any client in the country and to demonstrate that expertise and win projects off the back of that expertise. Tangentially, your staff are more engaged, they're working on things that are much bigger than themselves, like Tim said, and your ability to retain those staff longer term is um, massively bigger than what it would otherwise be. So standard tenure at, say, uh, a Google or a, an Apple is like 18 months. Um, many Drupal companies have tenures of seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so the business benefits of getting involved at that level far outweigh the, oh, you're asking me, me to pay $5,000 more a year to join this program? What are you going to do for me, Tim? <laughs> so it needs to be just seen through that lens. Yep. Um, how are we using AI in Drupal besides content editing? Are there any plans to expand its usage? Well, that's a good question. So, I mean, are there formal plans? No. But I think a next step, for example, would be... Uh, so today AI is used showed a lot more content creation capabilities, like in many different shapes, um, auto-tagging, translations, generating of content, these kinds of things. Uh, but I do firmly believe that in the future, AI will be used for more um, advanced tasks. Like, as an example, today, when you want to create a page, maybe in Drupal, you have to create the page, you have to maybe create a layout, assign the layout to the page, then you have to create some blocks, and then you have to move the blocks into the layout. Maybe one of the blocks is a forum. So guess what? Now you need to learn how to create forms in Drupal. Uh, click that together. And so by the time you've created like a simple landing page, let's say you've done a hundred something clicks. And oh, by the way, you have to learn a lot of different things. There's a lot of mental 
uh, concepts or mental models that you have to learn. And it's, it's actually not that easy. <laughs> as, as much as we try to make it easy with um, layout builder and tools like that. And it's, it's pretty obvious, I think, that in the future you're going to be able to prompt those things where you just type, create me a two column page. In the right column, put a form with a name and email field and a submit button. And by the way, make the submit button blue. So now you've avoided maybe somebody having to go mess around with CSS and Twig, which, I mean, that's a whole other world for people to learn, right? And then you hit enter or whatever, and it will put it together. And maybe it's not perfect, but then you can iterate, just like you might iterate today on content. Or you may just kind of click it to the finish line, you know? But then instead of 100, 200 clicks, it's maybe 10. <laughs> um, I think that's where the world will go. I don't think it will happen overnight. Because, I mean, as much as we like to talk about OpenAI integration, and it, it is great, it was, frankly, relatively easy. And I don't want to diminish the work. But a lot of organizations were able to integrate OpenAI in their applications, and, that, and that's great. Um, but they provided great APIs that made it relatively easy, um, especially relative to the picture that I just painted. I think that is an order of magnitude more complex, but also potentially way more disruptive. Um, and I think we need to find a way to experiment with those things and, and to play around with those things. And um, I mean, OpenAI was only released a year ago, something to remember. And it's only, I think, in recent months that open source LLMs have become powerful enough that we might be able to start experimenting with these, um, with these ideas. And so we don't have a formal plan, but I think the development is happening so recently that it was hard to make plans <laughs> because um, you know the availability of open source tools that we can use to build this wasn't there. But now the tools are starting to be there. Like some of the latest LLMs, large language models, are actually on par with GPT-4 in terms of power. And um, I would invite everybody actually in the community or those that are interested in the topic to start maybe doing some experiments and see what can be done. Maybe don't start with this complex example that I gave, but maybe there's simpler things that we can do uh, that allow us to kind of grow into this. I think that would be incredibly uh, inspiring to young people, and I think it could be potentially very innovative. And I think now that we have open source LLMs, we can also do it in a way um, that might fee make a lot more people feel comfortable with the um, sort of legal or ethical implications of using these tools. So I think just actually in the last few weeks or months, we've gotten to this point where we can uh, start having meaningful conversations about what we might do. All right. We've got, we've got just under five minutes. I want to go back to the prepared questions and do a lightning round. Max, one sentence each. How do you envision, uh, how do you envisage this community and project in 10 years' time? You can do a little bit more than one the, sentence. No. <laughs> in, in 10 years' time, in 10 years' time, the majority of companies and people in Drupal are um, under 40 years of age. Good answer. All right. I'll build on that. I would love to get to a point where um, we have a lot of new leadership into the Drupal project, where we can say something like, I don't know, half of the people that are in leadership roles, whatever it is, technical or DA or anything, um, have joined in the last you know, five years um, and are much younger and more diverse than the people up here on stage. That's fair. All right. Was Pitchburg considered to be successful? Are there plans to do this again, maybe annually? How do we ensure winning Pitchburg projects continue their momentum after funds run out? One sentence. One sentence. For, for, a, for a three or four question uh, sentence Give question. Give me a run-on sentence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, Pitchburg was successful. Uh, at DrupalCon, Portland in May, we will be doing a, a wrap-up of all those projects uh, and teaser alert. They should, they will all.
be completed by then. Um, the main goal of Pittsburgh was to kind of bring attention to a, kind of an innovative way to try to get um, funding for projects that kind of came from the grassroots and see if that was a mechanism for innovation. I think it, it is. The, I'm not sure we'll do exact Pittsburgh format. Um, but we are looking at a format that is less about an event and, and, and so forth and more kind of like a, a crowdfunding type of campaign possibly as a, as a, as a mechanism for doing Pittsburgh-like initiatives in the future. Okay. I'm going to go off topic, <laughs> but it's related, and just highlight the fact that, as Dries talked about, we think at a minimum there's about three billion US dollars worth of uh, project budget flowing through the Drupal ecosystem annually. And if we could harness 1% of that, that's a $30 million annual budget to direct towards innovative projects. And if you look at other mature open source communities like the Linux Foundation, that's a no-brainer for them. They spend $160 million every year on strategic projects in open source software. and. And that's the end goal that we're working towards. Pitchburg is like the little dip your toe in the water to s see whether it's possible. And we've proved that has been possible. And now it's a case of how do we scale it up um, to a point where we're just firing on all cylinders. OK. That, 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 that's what I'm excited about. All right, good, good answer. All right, last question. What's something you wish the Drupal community would do but isn't? What's something you wish the Drupal community would do but isn't? Sorry, I didn't think about this beforehand. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, again, it's a bit of a tangential answer, but we all bring our own idea of what Drupal is to Drupal. <laughs> and I think the, the interesting thing about having been involved in, in the board and kind of project strategy is that at a leadership level, and a coordination level, we're listening to all of those voices about what everyone thinks Drupal should be and trying to congeal that into a clear direction. And I think we're in a really good place with that now from a, a technical perspective, from a vision perspective, and it, it does give us that kind of foundation for the community to, to band around. Um, and that's what I'm, I'm really looking forward to see unfold in in future years, but I think getting back to your original question <laughs> is what I personally think of Drupal is kind of neither here nor there. I've got a, a bit of a say, but ultimately it's this kind of collective idea that we have together and, and we express that through our shared values. And if you're coming into the community, then you're adopting those values or saying that you agree with them. That, that's really key. Okay. I'll add, um, and it's not something that the Drupal community is not doing, that would be unfair, um, but it's a theme that you've heard, marketing outside, uh, you know, getting involved in marketing Drupal outside the community. So whether it's going to, going to events, um, joining DA-sponsored activities, but really seeing that for Drupal to survive, to push, to push markets, to, to um, you know, basically combat against some of the organizations that are trying to push Drupal aside, we need to be getting outside the, outside the community and outside the developer community. So we need to go to marketers, we need to go to C-suite decision makers, understand what messages resonate with them, and then be at the events that they're at with that message. I will jump on, to, on top of that and just say, tomorrow afternoon there's a panel with the uh, Drupal South Steering Committee, and after that at three o'clock there's a birds of a feather session with the, with the committee as well where we'll be talking about one of the initiatives that we've got, which is a Drupal booth at non-Drupal events here in Australia and in New Zealand. And the, the concept effectively is, is to do that, to reach out to our sponsors and help them, get them to help us staff that booth so that we can be at things like Tech in Gov and EduTech um, and other non-Drupal conferences with an opportunity to present Drupal as a solution to those decision makers that go to those events. So if you're interested in that and taking part in that, please come along to, that, to those two sessions tomorrow afternoon. Um, we are out of time. I've got the official, you're done. Um, I, please join me in uh, thanking all of our panelists for coming up here today and sharing their thoughts. Thank you.